any clinical experience of dealing with the anahasotus disorders as such. Now, among the anahasotus disorders, the first of the thing which we will discuss would be asepaka or somatitis. Interestingly, Sushruta has mentioned 64 types of the asepaka varieties as such, which are discussed in a Shalakya Tantra. That's Samstana Dushya Kati Nama Beda Uttayihi Tri Chatusha Sivirava Vandi. Now, this is a fantastic issue, uh, but though it may not be possible to make out all the 64, uh, I would like to pick up a few of those varieties of the Asepaka, which is often generally considered as a very silly or simple issue with the, the specificity and a specific management as we deal with in the routine clinical conditions. Among those stomatitis conditions, the commonest variety which we see quite frequently is uh, the mycolic ulcer. Mycolic ulcer is uh, the exact causes are not known. Often it is claimed to be produced due to deficiency of vitamins and the usual prescription which uh, the other contemporary system gives is uh, vitamins B complex or so on. And often it is related to the food as such. Those who consume more spicy food. Uh, they tend to develop this kind of lesions. Characteristically, these lesions are very superficial and size is smaller. Usually lasts for a few days or maximum two weeks and heal spontaneously. There will be no uh, scar as such. Incidence is quite frequent. These tend to occur quite frequently as such. Uh, and characteristically, the lesions are very characteristic, like very superficial as such and quite painful also. And in that condition, because it has all the resemblance to that of the Pittaja variety of Mukharoga, Pittata, Samurcha, Vidaha, Rujascha, Varnascha, Shukla, Aruna, Varjaha. There will not be a whitish color, somewhat reddish color, and that the hyperemia seen around the lesion is a quite characteristic in that condition. And my prescription in such condition would be Kamaduga, Sutta Shekara, Madhyasri. Of course, it is true that even without the medicines, it gets cured, but these medicines will reduce the duration of suffering and that also uh, gives a better feeling to the patient. That's one common variety. Now, another variety of the aspirous ulcer is a certain ulcer, where the ulcers become deeper. And the most common cause for the ulcer would be, these kinds of ulcers would be irritation due to some maybe irritant food as such or irritant medicines. Patients who consume more med, uh, some of those irritant medicines, they tend to develop these kinds of the ulcers. And characteristically, they are deeper. And the surface would be half a whitish color, which is typical of the Kafaja variety of the Mukharoga. And it takes longer time to heal. And also there is a tendency for multiple ulcers. And if not treated, they may coalesce. One ulcer may merge with another ulcer and the ulcers may go on becoming bigger and bigger. So that's the typical aptos ulcers or certain ulcers. So among the aptos ulcers, you have two mycolics and certains. Mycolix is more common and it's easy to treat, but as certain are, it takes longer time. And because of the involvement of the Kapadya variety, I, my prescription would be Gandhagata Sayana, Arogya Vardini, Khadira Arista and or Khadira Divati Chur. And this gives a better relief and maybe a shorter duration would be enough to manage that condition. Uh, another variety is uh, the major after ulcers, where the ulcers become quite deep and then the inflammation is quite significant. Incidence wise, they are not very common, comparatively rare. And most of the times, there will be some underlying systemic pathology. Underlying systemic pathology, like uh, either very often seen in enteric fever conditions, which in after enteric fever, they tend to develop that. Many times, quite severe conditions like uh, leukemia could be the underlying pathology or it could be the diabetes mellitus, so on. So once you have that kind of an after ulcer, deep and major after ulcers, which tend to be quite deep and quite huge, indurated, it's not only that they are visible, they are even palpable. In such conditions, the uh, identification of the underlying pathology is uh, important. And uh, uh, when the underlying pathology is identified naturally, the management would be based uh, to the underlying pathology, which has to be specified. Uh, once you have managed that underlying pathology, then as a specific management for the after ulcer, 
I would prefer triple of water gargling, triple of Google Gandha Grafana as in case of any of the product. And uh, this has all the features of uh, the uh, typical water jar variety of the Sarvasatra Vyadi or Sarvasaraha. Spotehi, Satodehi Badanam, Samantasa, this Achidam Sarvasara, Sarvata. I consider that as a Vatajam variety. One more variety of the Vatajam Kapata which we see is uh, the angular chelates. Angular chelates is again often the exact causes are not known. Uh, the one of the characteristic feature of the angular chelates is the location. It's at the angle of the mouth, and there will be scaling. The mucous membrane becomes thicker, rough, and that's exactly what's described in the text as a karkasha, parusha, stabda, krishna, tibra rudan middle, and dandiyate, karibhatiyate, vostho, marga papada. It's a vostho prakopa, though it's not a mukhapada. It's a vostho prakopa mentioned. And this kind of lesions are often seen in patients who are malnourished uh, or uh, poor nourishment as such is seen or at times it could also be seen as a familiar pathology in some families tends to occur quite frequently. It also could be a consequence of local irritation, local irritation due to some chemicals applied over the area which starts with that and then it may progress further. Angular chelitis also could be a consequence of uh, the diseases like uh, psoriasis like conditions at times some of the patients of pemphigus also can present with the angular chelitis so analysis assessment of these conditions are important when you do not have that specific disease like uh, uh, pemphigus or uh, psoriasis like conditions the treatment which i prefer in that condition would be kaisar gulu sariyadyas or avipatikar cure characteristically angular chelitis tends to recur and tends to be quite chronic for persists for a long duration. In such conditions, when it tends to occur repeatedly and uh, becomes quite troublesome, Virajana also is often preferred. Most of the times, Virajana gives a more definite and prolonged uh, relief from the conditions uh, than simply the Shamana Chikitsa or medical treatment. Another common variety which we see you now is uh, the nicotine somatitis. Of course, Sushruta might not have exactly mentioned the etiology, but the etiology of course, it's well known. It is due to the consumption of nicotine, either in the form of smoking or often that tobacco, uh, maybe that uh, chaini, khaini and so on, all that pan parag, masala and so on, that kind of issues. And it's well known, like it, it produces the irritation as such. In the beginning, it presents as a stomatitis. Later, it results in the sclerosis. Now, in the initial stages, when the person is having that irritation due to the nicotine, the lesions are very characteristic. It will be seen as a small superficial uh, erosions at times and then slightly the surface is elevated. Unlike that of uh, after sensor, it doesn't have severe pain. The pain is felt only when you consume the food. Comparatively painless and it's not limited to only to the buccal mucosa. It could be even present over the palate. And then as the condition progresses, you may see the changes over the tongue surface too, where the surface becomes rough and then even some polyps, high size polyps and increased vascularity. These are the typical signs of the nicotine stomatitis as such. Of course, the most important management would be avoiding that nicotine. That's important, absolutely essential. Many of the patients may respond very well once you have stopped the nicotine, but if it doesn't yield, then in such conditions, my prescription would be Aragivardini and then Agnitundi or Kamaduga, depending upon the presentation. When you have more of Pitta Jalakshanas, I prefer Kamaduga. When you have relatively more of Vata Lakshanas or Kapha Lakshanas, I prefer Agnitundi and Bhunimbadi Vata because it's always related to the Amla Pitta even. And uh, this is exactly what Sushudha has mentioned as Kapha Vata Jamukhapaka as such. Uh, though, in when we say clinically, we can see that uh, with the presentations of uh, Pitta Lakshanas too. And uh, the Trifala Kwata Gargling is another uh, important remedy. And uh, the characteristically, the import is a uh, comparatively less pain and uh, more of irritation when the person consumes the food. Many times the per persons may have the systemic symptoms related to that nicotine effect too. That's what Sushuda has mentioned, like Kandu Hukurutam, Siddha Vidyalatam, Sneho, Aruchihi, Jadya, Kapha, Prasekav, Jadya. 
is also another important thing. Utkvesha manda nalata, because of the systemic involvement, there will be the, some lower gastrointestinal tract symptoms too. Very often it's seen in nicotine somatitis. So combining all that together, the comprehensive treatment would be Arogyavarthini Agnachodi Bhunibadi Kwata, which is often prescribed and gives gratifying results. Another common variety of the ulcers in the mouth which we see would be the candidiasis. Uh, and uh, almost as a rule, candidiasis is consequence of a systemic pathology like uh, immunocompromised conditions uh, like uh, tuberculosis or even in case of diabetes mellitus, leukemia. These are all the conditions where candidiasis tends to occur. So, almost every patient of candidiasis, it's uh, absolutely necessary to identify the underlying pathology and that underlying pathology requires a specific treatment. Rarely you may come across a patient with candidiasis where you are not able to make out the underlying pathology. And once the patient has a candidiasis, the characteristic lesions are very scattered, multiple scattered and you will see that typical uh, adherent material, slimy material seen over and it's not really an ulcer, the whole surface seems to be inflamed and bald. Uh, my management in that condition would be Dandakarasana Kamatuka because uh, though it's meant, uh, it has all the features of uh, the Tridosha, Sarvani, Rupani, Toktaruke, Bhavan, Jasmin, Savajat, Syadha, Tridosha Lakshanas are seen. The main target of the management would be Pitta and Kapha and hence my preference would be Dandakarasana Kamatuka, Magistrati or Khadiradisha depending upon the other patient, uh, conditions of the patient. But quite important is uh, the underlying pathology needs to be managed. And triple apatha gargling also is uh, the other option which can relieve the patient significantly. Then another common condition which we now see is a submucous fibrosis. Again, which is a delayed consequence of that uh, palm chewing, different forms of the palm chewing. So either initi initially it's presented as uh, the nicotine ulcers, so small, but when the habit is continuing, particularly due to continuous physical contact with oral mucosa, submucous fibrosis occurs. And submucous fibrosis is a uh, uh, becoming more common these days, though officially the pan sale is uh, this masala sale is uh, banned, and uh, of course, uh, many young people would have this kind of a complication, and uh, it's considered to be one of the precancerous condition too. Though Susuta has not identified this uh, uh, etiology, the features are described in Bhagavata very clearly, where in a Samogata Vyadhi. The person would not be able to open the mouth fully. The, that's the very characteristic feature. Uh, as the total fibrosis occurs, the elasticity of the oral mucosa becomes reduced and the person would have very difficulty in opening the mouth and swallowing also. It's quite painful. And of course, the results are very poor. I don't say that any of the submucous fibrosis, when it, once it has occurred, it can be cured. It's a, virtually irreversible pathology, but patients can have some relief with the prescriptions of Kaishara Gukulu Gandhakrasayana Manjistati Kvata and Tila Taila Gandusha. Tila Taila Gandusha relieves the symptoms, at least improves the food intake. I don't say that any of the submucous fibrosis can be completely cured and virtually there is no curative treatment anywhere else too. All the treatment which is done is a, a palliative treatment and of course uh, it's considered as a precancerous condition, so be watchful about the malignant pathologies. Uh, at times, the biopsy also is required. Uh, and the most important is a prevention. So, if the person has that habit of chewing, that chewing habit should be completely stopped. Then, another condition which we see, though not commonly, occasionally, is a, the contact somatitis very often due to the cosmetics like lipsticks and so on applied over the area. As in elsewhere uh, uh, over the body, if there is any chemical coming into contact, the lips and the tip, uh, tongue also can become inflamed. And of course, in this condition, there is no specific description of a similar pathology in any of our Arabic texts. But I would consider this as a, a variety of uh, the hypersensitive reaction. And uh, the treatment, of course, is one major reason that, that whatever that allergen should not be continued to be in contact. And then the main prescription would be Lagosut Shekara Kamaruga and Manjistari Kwata. Uh, that's the other uh, form of the management. Uh, I have referred to this issue because 
these days this issue is also becoming somewhat common as such. Then the another of the condition which is also quite frequent and misleading would be the leukoplakia. Exact causes of the leukoplakia also are not known. Most of the times it is some either physical or chemical irritation and it's an essential precancerous condition. When you see an ulcer in the oral cavity, it's quite important that that needs to be palpated. If on palpation, if you find some induration, the leukoplakia has to be considered as one possible cause and the majority of these conditions may require a biopsy even. And uh, the contemporary medicine, virtually there is no treatment. But from our point of view, Sushil has described these conditions exactly with the similar issue presentation. Vritta unnataya shvayatu sadaha kandamitaha apaki amruduhu purushcha a swelling which is palpable and doesn't separate having induration is considered as a vrunda uh, or eka vrunda or uh, as such or the same would be also considered as a vrunda eka vrunda and vrunda whether they are two different conditions or whether uh, they are the two presentations of the same condition bit of controversy will not go into that part the maybe that vrunda is when you have more of the inflammatory signs like pitta kshata lakshanas pitta or rakta lakshanas it's like vrunda when you have more of kapha lakshanas the inflammatory symptoms are lesser, then it's the Eka Vrindha. In that condition too, there is no question of curative management. I don't say that it can be cured completely or it cannot be reversed. But a prolonged treatment with the Tripala Gugulu, Gandhakarasana, Khadirajasana and Tripala Kvata Gargling can ameliorate the symptoms, make the patient's life more comfortable. Uh, but a follow-up with the biopsy, if there is a malignant lesion, naturally, the outcome would be very poor as such. Another of the condition which is related to the tongue and the motoral cavity, which we commonly see is a, the bald tongue pathology or plumber Wilson syndrome, which is often a consequence of the iron deficiency anemia. Prolonged iron deficiency anemia is one of the causes, uh, one of the presentations there. And characteristically, the appearance would be a bald tongue and the oral mucus also will be quite bad and somewhat dry. Uh, patients would have a comparatively lesser appreciation of the taste. Rarely you may have a membrane formed at the base also, which makes it a difficulty in swallow. The difficulty in swallowing also could be the other clinical presentation of the plumber Wilson syndrome. And uh, this kind of a, a feature is uh, discussed in the context of uh, uh, the uh, 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 is um, uh, upadrava of the uh, 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 yeah rakshaya upadrava or in the conditions of the kshaya upadrava. Uh, these are mentioned particularly the pandu and the rakshaya upadrava's conditions. These are mentioned where the description is the same like kantagasa uh, shofa. Either that could be a membrane formed as a complication of the pandu, which is actually the same as such, and or uh, kanta uh, that's what Bhagavad has mentioned. So, a uh, impairment of the uh, oral cavity in the uh, complications of the pandu or Raktakshaya Upadrava is uh, mentioned in the Ayurvedic text too. And naturally, the course of the treatment would be to improve that. Uh, pandu and my preference in the treatment of such conditions is a thumbaprobaya serasaya and drubaya and draksha distant gunar namandura specific uh, drugs for the pandu and once the hemoglobin improves most of the patients would have a better feeling and the lesions also would be improved appearance also would be improved as such but it requires a prolonged treatment the other is uh, about the oral carcinomas and uh, as i have mentioned earlier uh, the incidence of the oral carcinomas are increasing now. Uh, most of the times, it's a, a consequence of the submucous fibrosis resulting in malignancy, or at times it could be the leukoplakia produced as a cause of irritation, no, source of irritation, and then resulting in as such. And uh, these are, as I said, it's uh, incurable, and uh, most of the times I would not treat them with any of our medicines. Uh, naturally, the patient has to be referred to a center where some malignant uh, treatment, either it could be the surgery or maybe the radiation, 
would be the preferred treatment outcome would be very poor only when the uh, condition has patients prefer our treatment only and there is virtually no other possibility i may use canton or google arogya vidine as a, a palliative treatment but uh, important is uh, to identify these cars like carcinoma conditions so oral ulcers it has to be very careful and when you have the lesions which are very fragile uh, as you see over this image or when they are indurated and swelling carefully evaluated and uh, they they need to be diagnosed at an early stage and early diagnosis makes a lot of difference there and that's about the oral carcinoma and then of course another variety of the conditions which we often see is uh, the denture stomatitis persons who use denture for a long time either it could be the improper shape of the denture or it could be due to the hygienic conditions the patient may have a irritation over the area and even it may present as a small uh, this uh, fluid containing vesicle like appearances in the denture stomatitis i don't say that there is any other specific management the only thing is the denture needs to be reviewed the it should be modified either the position of the denture or maybe the material of the denture needs to be modified but important is to identify the condition i don't say that there is any specific uh, medical management for that condition now one more of the condition which we often see in the clinical conditions are uh, patients who are under chemotherapy for some other lesions they tend to develop the oral lesions and it's a very common issue patients on chemotherapy developing the oral lesions are quite common and uh, the common presentations are typical presentations would be either that the tongue would be hairy like you will see the depositions over the tongue it may be having a dark or blackish color appearance and the patient would always complain of non appreciation of the taste and uh, intolerance to uh, some even a mild hot substances also so that's the one or it could be like the mucositis where the whole mucus looks very inflamed Uh, the whole mucosa uh, become uh, seems to be inflamed there, and uh, uh, that's the mucositis conditions as a, which has a, the typical features of the pitta variety, or there could be even ulcers in that conditions. Of course, the identic identification of the condition is relatively easier because the uh, you will have the history history of uh, the chemotherapy being used as. A, of course we will not meddle with the chemotherapy or that process of the chemotherapy a symptomatic relief can be achieved by tilsaila gandosha which i am usually suggest in that condition and kamadugaras also helps in reducing the trouble to the patient to a certain extent so that's what usually i prefer in such conditions as well. uh, that's a, the one more variety of the oral ulcers which we see So those who should have mentioned 64, we will not go into all 64. Next of the condition which we see quite frequently related to the gastrointestinal tract, where the exact diagnosis may not be possible, is dyspepsia syndromes. Dyspepsia syndromes, even now with all that sophisticated investigation, are identified as a specific disease entity. and uh, you have get, you can get the even typical icd code a specific yeah. icd code where the icd code now is 536.8 536. uh, so i will refer to the dyspepsia where the underlying pathologies are not really made out as such dyspepsia produced as a symptom of other diseases is not the point which we are discussing see dyspepsia could be produced due to multiple conditions and when the patient has some other systemic disorder they need to be treated and that could be the uh, reason treatment for the dyspepsia now so uh, vagmata has mentioned specific certain specific causes for that arojaka or dyspepsia where it could be doshehi jihva hrudaya samshehi either it could be some local pathology local variations in the physiological conditions of the tongue or oral cavity or it could be in the even psychological condition so there is some thing manasa santapena it could also be produced due to a simple psychological stress the, the person may have the dyspepsia which is a very common experience uh, some psychological variations producing these conditions 
and the identification of that pathology would be based upon the appre taste appreciated by the patient like kashaya tikta madhuram vatadi shukham kramata uh, it will be kashaya rasa uh, bitter taste in case of vataja uh, conditions or madhura in case of kapaja conditions and that's how it has to be assessed and most of the times they do not require any specific treatment and the best of the treatment would be a modification of the food a light food or overnight fasting is enough to manage the condition if at all the patient still requires any treatment i don't suggest medical treatment i would be preferring ayurvedic chuna or himvastaka chuna for one or two days short duration most important is to take care of the diet the any um, oily and uh, uh, most more irritant food substances need to be avoided and overnight fasting is the best of the remedy for some such dyspepsia now a dyspepsia in ayurveda has another variety it's not only arochaka arochaka with avipaka that there is an abnormality of the digestion which is persisting for a long duration so arochaka with avipaka is another condition which requires a specific treatment a simple arochaka doesn't require any specific treatment uh, whereas the arochaka with avipaka where there is a improper digestion also where the symptoms will be persisting for a longer duration and the person would have a typical presentation of na anne ruchir bhavati patient would not have a, a, a this feeling uh, of taste in the appreciation of the taste of food at all and along with that the symptoms could be chula pirana yutam virasana natam vadatmake when there is a pain symptoms of pain and in the chest or maybe the upper part of the abdomen which is often we know often say as gastritis like condition which is in, suggests of involving of involvement of the lower part of the uh, gat also or it could be like burning sensation hridaya kosha bhuta bahu mukhatikta data where the person would have burning irritation in the esophagus is a chest area or a simply a heaviness as such these are the symptoms which are seen in case of the arotika and avipaka now that dyspepsia in the current approach the latest guidelines for the management of the dyspepsia according to the current issue is uh, all dyspepsia patients need not be subjected to further investigation this is what the nice guidelines says which is not generally done in the regular practice in the regular practice usually the patients are prescribed some either a proton pump inhibitors or h2 receptor blockers and then a series of investigations like endoscopy is done regularly which is generally which is not required as per the guidelines as per the guidelines most patients of this case they can manage with the without investigation and indication for referral is based only when there are alarm signs and the important is the alarm signs a patient presenting with that dyspepsia with the arochaka if the patient has any of these alarming signs the, and those alarming signs are chronic gastrointestinal bleeding either it could be visible bleeding or it could be the occult blood test positive in the stools or progressive weight loss and where other reasons for weight loss are not identified or if there is a dysphagia along with that dyspepsia if there is persisting anemia if there is a persisting iron deficiency anemia and if you are able to palpate a mass either in the epigastric area or anywhere in the abdomen then these are considered as a, the warning signs alarm signs which require a specific treatment a uh, specific investigation process you need to go into the further investigation process other conditions they can be considered as a symptom dyspepsia condition and that icd code which i have apply, uh, suggested applies to those conditions where we do not have any of those alarm signs now management of these uh, dyspepsia with the no alarm signs the typical standard guideline contemporary guideline i'm just referring to a contemporary guideline and the assessment and comparing it to what ayurveda says it's a very interesting issue and this guideline is uh, issued by uh, the clinics of north america which is a very standard asset and the dyspepsia with no alarm signs they are categorized into four categories in the contemporary science that's with the predominant heart but nausea and vomiting conditions post prandial distress syndrome where the person would have a abnormality of the motility of the stomach and epigastric pain syndrome pain syndrome where the patient would have pain now 
very interesting is that this is exactly on the same lines but Sushruta has categorized Bhattaja where there will be pain, Pittaja where there will be burning and Kappaja where there will be heaviness. And interesting is it is exactly the same. There is a predominant heartburn and nausea which are the typical of the Pittaja lakshanas and then epigastric pain is the uh, Bhattaja lakshana. Postprandial distress syndrome would have some more of the implications. Now, we, I consider that postprandial distress syndrome as Ajirna. So, that management and guideline is we will discuss in the next slide. First, we will discuss about what the correct approach of predominant heartburn and nausea vomiting is. In that condition, the present approach would be one is lifestyle modification and as usual, the proton pump inhibitors are the prescription which are given in the contemporary science. But from our point of view, it's typical of Pittaja involvement in both these. We consider both of them as a, the Pittaja variety of the Arochaka and our Pittaja variety of Arochaka as a, And my treatment is a Sutta Shekara, Kama Duga, and Godantya Vipatika. And one important is persons who are on post these proton pump inhibitors. Now, these days, proton pump inhibitors being consumed as a, a over the counter product has become quite common and the persons who take the proton pump inhibitors regularly they tend to have rebound symptoms uh, either when they withdraw or when they are not taking regularly even after regular intake there can be rebound symptoms and such instances are quite common and usually they end up in ayurvedic treatment uh, conditions in such conditions my specific prescription would be arogyavadhi a proton pump uh, related conditions, persons who have the history of consuming proton pump inhibitor drugs regularly, who tend to develop these symptoms, my prescription would be Aragyavardini, Kamaduga, Godantyavipatikara. If there is not much of such a history, Sutta Shekara, Kamaduga, Godantyavipatikara, uh, which is uh, prescribed considering as a, the Pittaja variety asset, and it gives very gratifying results. Then comes the epigastric uh, syndromes. That's the typical of the Bataja variety. That's the epigastric pain syndrome. And in that condition, my treatment would be Agni Tundi Sutta Shekara Godanti Alvartikara, which gives a better result as well. Now, those conditions that there is a gastric emptying abnormality, we will consider this as Ajirna. And the contemporary method of classifying this is either a delayed gastric emptying. And uh, accelerated gastric emptying with or maybe patients with a normal gastric emptying period. Now, delayed gastric emptying and accelerated gastric emptying can be uh, assessed clinically based upon the clinical symptoms. Like if a patient complains about a heaviness in the stomach after consumption of food and uh, not able to pass the stools, there is uh, distension and the patient has more constipation or uh, the stools passed are not. Uh, uh, up to the quantity which is expected. That's the typical of the delayed gastric empty. Whereas in the accelerated gastric empty, the patient would have more pain immediately after consumption of the food. And in that condition, patient would have more liquid, uh, either frequent stools or liquid stools. Normal conditions, the, it will be that patient would not have an appetite, but bowel movements, they may seem to be normal. And important is, from my very point of view, the Ajirna is classified mainly in, under the same head. Vistabdha Ajirna is delayed gastric emptying. That's exactly the typical feature which you see. Then, of course, Vidabdha is the other variety where the patient would have more burning sensation and uh, maybe a faster movement of the stools. That's the Vidabdha where the digestion would not be proper. Vishuchi is uh, the other way where the patient may have a, a liquid stools, uh, diarrhea like symptoms, and alasaka is uh, the patient who have more distension of the abdomen. Bilambika is exactly that what is mentioned as a delayed gastric emptying. So, Ajirna consequences according to Ayurveda, they are much more detailed than what the contemporary approach says. So, we have more categories, more classification than what the contemporary science says. Now, the a typical clinical presentation of these conditions are in the patients who have the typical presentation of the Amadirna, Kukshihe Anahate Atyartam Pradamyati Vikujati. Patient would have a, 
distance of the stomach and then you will have more of the gurgling sounds also and the uh, would, would not pass the stools regularly that's the typical of the alasaka which is also a delayed gastric emptying variety as such and my management in that condition would be either admitting arogyavardini jirakadyarista when the patient has more of symptoms of the pain or if the patient has more of reduced appetite then kumari also so admitting the arogyavardini is the main state of the drug which i give and the results are much better than what the other contemporary science uh, can give then in case of uh, the uh, accelerated gastric emptying uh, that's uh, the typical of uh, the uh, vishuchika or when the stool uh, should be passing very rapidly murcha atisara vamathuk pipasa where there could be that burning sensation increased the stool presentation and then systemic symptoms of thirst or even rarely dehydration like conditions that's the typical presentation and in that condition main treatment will be Sutta Shekara, Anandavi Ravi, Bhunimbadi Kwata or Mustakarista. Mustakarista when the patient has more liquid stools, Bhunimbadi Kwata when the consistency of the stools is not very liquid. Sutta Shekara, Anandavi Ravi is the mainstay of the drug. Many times it also can result in more stress or at times it could be stress related. These kinds of the symptoms could be stress related. In those, where there is a visible evidence of the stress, Sutta Shekara also is prescribed as a, a prescription which improves the condition and the duration of the treatment required in this condition will be longer period than compared to the alasaka variety as such. Then the third variety is um, where uh, the vilambika and in the vilambika conditions the typical description which is mentioned in the text is uh, what we see now where pravartate nordhum udhashyas adhashyasya after consumption of the food, the patient would feel that the food neither moves up nor down. He may have an urge for defecation but doesn't pass. He may have a reaching but he is not able to omit. And there will be some discomfort continuously. That's the typical presentation of the Vilambika. And our prescription would be Agnikundi, Aragyardini or Chitrakadi. Chitrakadivati when there is more of the pain as such. Aragyardini when there is more of heaviness as such. And Kumari as such. And these conditions also occasionally may require Smutsagarasa. In total, the approach of Ayurvedic treatment is definitely better than the, what the contemporary system can provide as such. And the important uh, guideline according to Ayurveda is Nacham parimitahara halabhante vidagamaha mudahastam aditatmanaha halabhante kalusha ashayaha. The basic important issue is you always have to have Parimita Ahara, a proper diet. If you have a proper diet, proper diet in the sense to the limit which is required physiologically is consumed, then you will never have this disease. Labhante Giritagama, you will never have that disease as such. And only those who do not follow that regime, they tend to develop these complications and their system would be affected. And this guideline is a very important guideline to prevent these conditions as such. That's about the Ajirna, one of the other conditions as such. Another of the disease related to the Anamasotas which we discussed would be Chardi. Now, again, a issue of controversy, whether Chardi or vomiting has to be considered as a disease or when it has to be considered as a symptom of other diseases. This is again a bit of issue. We'll refer to both the issues. You'll have plenty of conditions where the vomiting can be presented as a symptom of the other disease. So a patient presenting with a symptom uh, of chardi has to be assessed thoroughly. Only when you do not find any definite underlying pathology, we will consider it as a chardi vyadhi acid. And Sushura also has mentioned the same, like the causes of the chardi could be huge. It could be uh, physical, psychological, or it could be due to other systemic conditions that it could be uh, as such. So from the current point of view, when a patient comes to you, it's important that we need to assess the, all the possible conditions which could be producing the vomiting. And it could be, now though I have suggested this list as such, it's not a complete list. It's just about the common conditions, general guidelines. But the in general, the approach would be 
<coughs> if a patient presents in the omitic, you need to take history of alcoholism because that's one of the commonest conditions they are becoming now. And then of course, consumption of the drugs is another condition. Persons who consume lots of irritant drugs like NSA, cigarettes and so on, opiates and uh, so on, they can induce omitic. Then the diseases like hepatitis, gastroenteritis, they need to be ruled out. Then diabetic pathologies, ketoacidosis, which are quite severe conditions underlying pathology, they need to be ruled out. Or similarly, intra-abdominal pathologies like peptic ulcer conditions, they need to be considered as such. So when you do not have those conditions, or maybe even when you have under, can be, uh, identified some of those common conditions, my approach to the management would be, uh, where you do not have any other uh, obvious evident conditions which require other direct intervention, a general management in patients presenting with the, the omitting as a symptom of other disease conditions, maybe in the form of what we see frequently in the clinical practice, one is the food poisoning, where you have a typical history like a person consuming some odd food per a day or two and then the patient has omitted out. And characteristically, the omitting becomes less frequent once the stomach is emptied. Often the patient may also have diarrhea. Uh, there could be a low degree of toxicity symptoms like fever. And my prescription would be either admittedly and another viral. Uh, it's uh, to improve the digestion. And uh, maybe once the stomach is emptied, and then further follow up would be with the, a low calorie diet or light diet like ganji, uh, khichdi, of course. Kichdi has now become quite popular uh, due to our AMA. Now, anyway, that Kichdi is one of the life saving uh, food assets. And Agnitundi and Anandamira is my prescription in such conditions. Uh, and patients would respond very well uh, unlike, unless the patient has gone to a stage of dehydration. If the patient is having a dehydration, then of course we may require a fluid supplement. Then the other common condition is the gastritis, where the person would have irritation in the stomach and burning sensation, that heart burning feeling like. And the omitting also, we will have typical character of the omitting where the moment the person consumes the food, there will be some omitting and pain in the upper abdomen. And uh, my prescription will be Sushikara and Kamadika. Or occasionally we'll add Godanti Avipatikara to unlock. Peptic ulcer, characteristically peptic ulcer, they need prolonged treatment. And uh, once the peptic ulcers are diagnosed, the minimum duration of treatment would be minimum three months. At times, it could be more than that. And uh, the main description would be the same, like Sushikara, Kamadika, Godanti Avipatikara, or occasionally Bunimbadik Vata when the patient would not have much of the you know, constipation as a symptom. Uh, at times, it could be presented with loose tools. In, and the only issue is the treatment has to be prolonged. Another common condition for the omitting which we see in the clinical practice is the worm infestation condition. But uh, children very often. And uh, my prescription would be clinicotara sagnitoli for four days. And if necessary, we will repeat it after a month. And that would be one of the common solutions. Then another common condition where Ayurvedic practitioners would meet with would be hepatitis. Of course, hepatitis needs to be diagnosed. And when I say it's not a prescription for the chardhya or omitting, but it's a comprehensive management for the hepatitis. Omitting subsides by itself. No need of any other specific substance for that omitting acid. Another is the vestibular pathology. Patients who have a vestibular pathology, a Meniere's disease or traveling sickness. That's another common uh, what we call as motion sickness who tend to, when they feel like omitting when they travel. Of course, in that condition, the dietary restriction is important. Uh, when you travel with an empty stomach, incidence of the omitting would be lesser. But if even then, if it is persisting, or in the patients like Meniere's disease where you have a vestibular pathology and hence the person have the omitting, and characteristically, this omitting would be always related to the posture. When the patient is moving about, the omitting would occur. In the lying down posture, there will be no omitting or no reaching even. And in that condition, my prescription would be Sutsagara and Kamadoga. And it gives more satisfactory results than so called the drugs which are often used as regular over the counter prescription like aromine and so on for the traveling sickness, motion sickness. Smithsagara Kamadoga is a better option than other way. Then, Patients with the neurological conditions, neurosis, 
that too the omitting can occur and main distribution will be Smith Sagara plus Sarasvara star. And one important is that if you are not able to make out the causes, or at times you may have intractable omitting due to underlying pathology, one of the drugs which can suppress the omitting, reduce the omitting effectively, at least temporarily, is myelopic chavasma. Uh, virtually, even in case of viremia patients, myelopic chavasma reduces the omitting. I am not saying that condition would be cured. So, I use myelopic chavasma as a symptomatic treatment for omitting. Uh, irrespective of the pathology when it is needed. Not that every patient is given myelopic chavasma, only when other treatment doesn't produce satisfactory results or you have a patient where the vomiting has to be somehow suppressed uh, as early as possible, myelopic chavasma is uh, my choice of the treatment. That's about one of the conditions. Next of the condition which we see uh, in case of the anavas rotus is a shula or pain in abdomen. Again, I am referring to those pain in abdomen conditions where you may not have a specified underlying pathology in initially. Then we will go into that condition where the underlying pathologies are identified. Even that pain in abdomen are, uh, also is a specific diagnosis in the current system. In the ICD code 10, you have the same R10.1 code for a pain localized to the upper abdomen. Where the, it's again suggests you do, it's not a vague diagnosis, it's a standard diagnosis even in the current situation. Causes for the pain in the abdomen mentioned in text also is quite relevant and uh, the causes could be anything like either Atibhojanata, Ajirnata, Adhyashana, Ayasa, Virudha, Arnopa Sevanata, Paniyapana, Kshutkale, Virudha, Arnopa Sevanata. So the causes could be very huge and most of them they may be related to the consumption of the food, either the time or the duration or the quality, quantity, all these are the issues which are to be considered and these we consider as a, the shula. Then other disease conditions are the more specific conditions. Now, uh, the management, when I say about these drugs and prescriptions, it's not about those specific disease conditions, it's about those temporary phenomena where the person would have a pain in the abdomen with the diet related factors and usually for a short duration. In the uh, typical Vataja Shula, it often occurs in a person who is uh, not consuming the food properly, Nirahara Se Seva. In empty stomach, it tends to occur quite frequently and uh, the patient also may have constipation. In such conditions, one of the drugs which gives immediate relief could be Nabivati. Nabivati, I consider this as a, a symptomatic drug also. And such conditions, that's one of the specific drugs. The Jiyaka Garista and usually a few drops of Ajamodarka used to would be giving the relief in such conditions. That's the usual prescription. Or the other drug which I prescribe would be Agnitundi in case of Vatanishwada. But Agnitundi generally is not required unless it is quite severe. Moderate conditions, they can be immediately relieved with Nabivati and then Jiyaka Garista with a small few drops of uh, Ajamodar as such. Kapata Shula is, uh, uh, it often occurs uh, after consumption of the food where the patient would have maybe saliva, excess of salivation and heaviness in the stomach and a distress pain as such. That's the typical Kapata Shula. And this also is another common category which we see. And I consider treat them as a uh, with Agnitundi either Bhunimbadi Kvata or Hingvastakaturna, depending upon the presentation, when the patient has a more of discomfort and uh, a, a reduced appetite persistently, Hingvastakaturna is preferred. Whereas if the person has somewhat a moderate appetite and discomfort is moderate, then Bhunimbadi Kvata is preferred. Now, Pitaja variety of Shula, it mimics lots of other disease conditions. So, uh, where there will be inflammatory pathology of the abdomen. One of the important issues is whenever there is any inflammatory pathology in the abdomen, anywhere in the abdomen, it could be in the appendix, it could be in the gallbladder, it could be in the pelvic area. In, a, in any of those inflammatory conditions, there will be a reflex vomiting. And that reflex vomiting is uh, the exact clinical presentation what we see in case of uh, the Pitaja variety, where you will have the pain as well as systemic symptoms, toxemia-like symptoms, fever and systemic symptoms like Madha, Murcha, Krishna and Shita Bhikamata. These are all the symptoms of the toxicity and hence 
this needs to be thoroughly assessed and the underlying pathology has to be made out. Now, uh, 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 of course, to make a complete list of that condition will be quite difficult, but in general, uh, for a, a moderate assessment of the clinical condition is uh, depending upon the location of the pain. If the pain is located over the right head contact area, you need to think of the pathologies related to the gallbladder and of course the gastric ulcer. Occasionally pancreatic pathology. Pancreatic pathology pain could be either central abdomen or at times it could be right hypocontent area. Or when it is in the lumbar area, renal pathologies have to be considered. And the iliac area, pelvic pathologies, appendicular pathologies, they need to be considered. So causes could have to be assessed thoroughly. A thorough clinical examination is a very important in such conditions. In general, we may categorize these categories into either obstructive pathology like pyloric stenosis, obstruction, etc., or inflammatory pathology of the abdomen, cholecystitis, pancreatitis, appendicitis, etc. One primary difference in obstructive and these inflammatory reflex vomiting is that in a reflex inflammatory vomiting produced due to inflammatory pathologies of cholecystitis, pancreatitis, appendicitis, etc., and all that condition would be. The omitters would be reduced once the first omitters, there will be more omitters, but consequent omitting, the omitting would, omitters would be reduced, and even there could be dry omitting at times. Whereas in an obstructive pathology, the quantity of the omitters tends to go on increasing. Uh, even after the stomach is emptied, the secretions of the stomach or uh, intestines they are uh, omitted out. And in a very severe intestinal obstruction, distal obstruction, even fecal like vomiting, though rare, it's not common, it could occur. So primarily, this is important to make out that difference and the underlying pathologies have to be identified as such. Treatment would be based upon these specific conditions. I don't suggest any specific treatment or a generalized treatment for all these conditions. The treatment has to be specific according to the conditions as such. Now, those underlying pathologies, I would consider them as though it's not exactly as per our text. It's a slight modification of the concept of the text. I will consider those underlying pathologies under the Gulma, Udara or Antarvidhati. These conditions which are the common causes of this Pitsaja variety, they could be identified as a Gulma, Udara or Antarvidhati and these uh, could be made out as such and we need to follow the lines of the treatment of Gulma, Udara or Antarvidhati and uh, the uh, uh, typical clinical symptoms mentioned by Sushur about the location of that uh, Shula uh, or Antarvidhati according to Shula, Gudeya Bhata Nirosis to Bastav Krishalpa Mutrata Nabhyam Hikka Tata Atobha Kukshav Marga Kopan These are all a practically relevant methods of making the diagnosis and uh, uh, we have to consider them before we make the management or plan the management. Now, I will be just referring to some of the common conditions which we can manage to a great extent. Uh, and there has to be a caution in all this. Uh, to go into every detail of this aspect would be beyond the scope of what we can discuss in a few hours. But I will be just, and to go into all the conditions also is not possible. So I will be referring to some of the common disease conditions where we can have some specific approach from Ayurvedic point of view. Among them, appendicitis is quite common. Of course, appendicitis in general is considered as a surgical disease. And the indications for the surgery in the contemporary science are almost every appendicitis is considered as a surgical. But the specific indications are when the total count is more than uh, 14,000. And obstructive appendicitis complications, of course, they are the indications for the surgery. But from my point of view, when I manage the patients with the Ayurvedic approach, I will be stretching this indication to even a, a count of more up to 20,000. So then I won't go for surgery. A course of antibiotics followed by Agnitindi, Amdamira and Jirakadavista can help in resolution of appendicitis and in a large number of patients, surgery can be avoided. Now, my clinical experience, I would like to present that, the my clinical experience and how I have handled this. In the beginning of my career, uh, that's in the initial stage of my career, uh, uh, 
the number of surgeries which we had done were more. So in between 1983 when I started my practice to 2004, the number of patients whom I have seen of acute appendicitis, among them a larger number were operated. Reddish is a surgical management system. Whereas in the past five years up to 2019, the last one, one year's data is not added over, the number of patients of appendicitis I have treated is uh, increased and a large number are treated with the medical management. Surgery is uh, reduced in larger number. And this is one of the important highlight where I say like what is an Ayurvedic surgeon or Ayurvedic Shalya Tantra can contribute a, a non-surgical management for a surgical disease. And avoiding surgery is one of the specific contribution of Shalya Tantra which we can claim as our identity. And this is what uh, the changes which have occurred during the course of my practice. And uh, this is more acceptable to the patient which is seen by the larger number of the patients number of patients are increasing and we can avoid the surgery and the treatment which i give is the same follow like same protocols like uh, a short course of antibiotics if necessary and the surgery is done only when my surgery when i do the surgery the surgery is done only when the count is more than 20,000 and very obvious of obstructive appendicitis or you have a complication like perforation, gangrene or so on, then only the surgery is done. And that's one of the important issues. And another of the conditions similarly is the cholecystitis. Again, that Shula, Pitaja Shula variety. Uh, of course, the clinical diagnosis is important. And there again, my approach to the management is uh, something different from the general guidelines which are followed. General guidelines of cholecystitis now is uh, Every calculus cholecystitis is uh, treated with the surgery and uh, almost every gallbladder pathology, once a patient has a gallbladder pathology, the surgery is done now. But we can manage a large number of patients without surgery if we are selective and careful in the clinical uh, assessment. My approach to the condition is uh, if a person has a calculus cholecystitis and the person has come in an acute state, an antibiotic regime may be necessary and then the recurrence can be effectively prevented by a prolonged treatment of Aragivardini, Mrtinja and Kumariya Only when there is a evidence of gallbladder wall thickening and more than 10 millimeters, so wall thickening is more than 10 millimeters so seen under ultrasonography, surgery may be necessary. Otherwise, a calculus cholecystitis where there are no stones, then there is no need of surgical treatment. A calculus cholecystitis with the acute presentation often may require surgery and surgery is a choice because the course is unpredictable. Then you will have a large number of patients where there will be asymptomatic gallstones, patients presenting with the gallstones but gallstones being identified only when the ultrasonography is done, no evidence of uh, uh, no clinical evidence as such. In that condition, my prescription would be always prefer to non-surgical management and if it is a large single stone that's usually a cholesterol stone we can give a, a sure results like aragyalutin and kumaria so we taken for a prolonged duration like three to four months can help in complete re resolution surgery is not required but in case of multiple small stones uh, there is one risk the risk is by chance the stone may migrate into a common bile and produce an obstruction so that's one thing where we have to be careful and there is some unpredictability. Uh, of course, the patients can be managed with the same Arogyarjan and Kumariya, so, uh, but one of the unpredictability is uh, a small stone may migrate into the common bed and once it obstructs the common bed, the patient would have an obstructive jaundice which requires essentially surgical treatment and uh, so the choice has to be there. The patient has to be educated about that risk only when the patient is ready to take the risk I will be managing that condition medically, otherwise surgery is uh, the usual choice as such. Then pancreatitis is another condition. Acute pancreatitis is a definitely medical emergency and where we need to give large amount of IV fluids and uh, antibiotics are necessary and I don't think that only ayurvedic treatment would be uh, enough to manage because it is a severe medical emergency as such. So 
I would not hesitate to use any of those uh, modern approach as such. But a chronic recurrent pancreatitis is our field, ayurvedic field, where contemporary medicine system doesn't have any satisfactory solution. Pancreatic extracts given do not really resolve the issue. Whereas the treatment like Admitrundi Arogya Vajini Kumayasa, the typical Pitta Jashula Chikitsa, or if the patient has a, the episodes of fever during that Mrutyanjalas also is prescribed, definitely would give a better results, more reliable results than other way. Only thing is the treatment duration may have to be prolonged as such. It's also a Pitta Jashula and that can be managed. So that's about some of the common conditions. I will not go into all the other details are related to less common conditions as such. Now next of the condition which we discuss related to the Annamahas focus will be Atisara or the diarrhea conditions. Again, Atisara causes diarrhea also could be produced due to multiple causes. So identification of the causes is a very important thing in diagnosis the condition, diagnosing the condition as such. And your approach to the management would be based upon the identification of the causes. So, uh, and that requires a detailed clinical assessment as such. The common varieties which we consider, which we see and frequently seen are the MEB colitis, particularly in our area where the MEB ACC is quite endemic. The MEB colitis with the acute condition, the acute presentation, it has all the clinical features of Vataja Atisara. So, and the typical presentation would be Vartaja Munchaji Alpam Alpam Sapenam Ruksham. Is a small quantity of the stools passed every time. Frequency is increased and there is a griping pain. Uh, that's the typical presentation of uh, uh, acute amoebic colitis. And I'm 100% sure we need, can manage them without any specific anti amoebic treatment. That so called anti amoebic treatment like metanodazole are not really necessary in such condition. We can effectively manage with the Agnitundi and the Verevi and Mr. Garista. The duration could be up to three weeks or occasionally slightly bit more. A MEB colitis which presents in a chronic condition. Many times the patient would have persistent clinical uh, uh, MEB acids. Stool tests may become negative even, but still the patient may have the clinical symptoms. Not much of a tenderness. Frequency is not much high. Tendency for recurrence and at times it could be even related to the food. And characteristically, the patient would have more of urge for defecation, not much of a mucus. That's the again chronic maybe colitis clinical signs. And that's exactly what we see in case of the Kapha Jati Sara. Vega Shanki, Sustavit Kobi Bhuyaha. Patient would have a feeling of incomplete defecation even after passing the stools. That's the typical presentation of the Kapha Jati Sara. And my treatment in that condition would be Gandhakar Sayana and the Bedevi Mustakarista. And these are the cases where Ayurvedic treatment could be much better than the contemporary system. Anti amoebic treatment doesn't help at all in this condition. Whereas in acute amoebic colitis, of course, anti amoebic drugs also can resolve. Whereas in the chronic amoebic colitis, this would fail, and it's only Ayurvedic treatment which can help. And that's one area which gives you a fertile area. I would consider this as a fertile area where we can produce a huge change and number of such patients also are quite huge. You will see a large number of patients and of course in all these a dietary restriction is important like consuming raw food uh, should be as far as minimized, well cooked and less spicy food has to be advised. Pitta Jati Sara, that's the typical presentation in case of the bacterial colitis and bacterial colitis characteristically would have more of toxic symptoms and uh, will have very high fre frequency of uh, stools, very times, many times watery stools. That's exactly what's mentioned in our Samhita. Like Durgandhi Ustam Vegavan Mamsatoya Pratyam, where you have Mamsatoya, like watery and maybe the serous discharge uh, stools. And uh, the Srinadeha, systemic symptoms of uh, sweating and uh, loss of water, the dehydration symptoms also. Pitam, Murcha, Daha, Paka, Jara, fever and systemic symptoms are seen, bacterial colitis like condition. Bacterial colitis conditions also can be effectively managed with diuretic management alone. 
rarely you don't need an antibiotic treatment and the treatment would be mutinja very musakarista usually it subsides by one week of course the one very cautious would be there is always a possibility of dehydration if there is an obvious signs of dehydration you may need to replace the fluids at times iv fluids also are required so fluid replacement is mandatory assessment of the fluid condition also is essential in bacterial colitis but we can definitely manage without antibiotics as such one more variety of that atisara which we commonly see is the irritable bowel syndrome or chronic colitis like condition where it's often due to the stress issue irritable bowel syndrome the causes are many and a lot of confusion about that irritable bowel syndrome in the present situation and uh, the characteristic feature would be a patient would have a incomplete feeling of defecation or at times increase the frequency of defecation uh, the patient may have a, a go to the uh, loop and may not pass the stools and virtuo mistum nipurishan sadandham nirgandham va either it could be with a foul smell or without foul smell and but still every time the patient would have the same worry and often it is related to the stress shokotpanna dushti kitsa hati matram roga this is uh, the often related to stress as it and in that condition my prescription would be smitsa gadasa ananda viravi or kamaduga depending upon the presentation when the patient has more of a, the loose stools and uh, uh, less of burning sensation is ananda viravi if it is more of burning sensation and uh, comparatively firm stools it is a kamaduga which is prescribed or similarly either mustakarista or sarasvarista this is my prescription in case of the irritable bowel syndrome and definitely patients respond much better than what the contemporary system would be produced rarely you may need a pitta basti like conditions I mean the simple medicines happen either the patient may not respond or sometimes it can result in recurrence in such conditions pitta basti will definitely help in resolution of the symptoms and that's an area where again we can have an upper edge another variety is the amati sara grahani which i consider as a mal absorption syndrome now whether it has to be considered a mal absorption sara or whether it has to be considered as a separate issue we will not go into the controversy that mal absorption is one of the uh, troublesome complications which we see now in the clinical practice which are produced due to huge number of causes and uh, the characteristic feature is uh, the absorption is incomplete and hence undigested food substance is seen in the stools and it as it uh, affects the nourishment and hence because the nourishment has been affected it can produce the clinical symptoms like kashyam dhumakah tamakah jwarah murcha shiroor kvistambah shwet karapadayo uh, it can present any of those systemic symptoms like kashya Uh, weight loss or maybe a general debility at times it could produce vague symptoms as such and uh, the important is the underlying specific causes have to be ruled out as such causes could be many persons who have undergone abdominal surgery they tend to develop this malabsorption or post polycystic many sort of abdominal surgeries chronic pancreatic patients also can have malabsorption So chronic liver pathology is can present with that the genetic disorders also and one more important is the drugs substances who are on medicines many medicines also can present with the malabsorption so assessment of these conditions are important and many times you may have to have a specific strategy according to that underlying pathology now once that underlying pathology is ruled out and then the general management would be i would be preferring aragyavardini agnitundi or kamaduga that agnitundi is when the appetite is reduced kamaduga is when the patient has a moderate appetite and has more of pitta reduction and or mustakarista or kumariyasara it's not that all that are given to the same patient the choice would be mustakarista when he has patient has more of loose stools like kumariyasara is when the nourishment is poor or patient is having weight loss appetite is reduced so this way we can manage the patients better i don't say that the patient can be completely cured but definitely there can be a effective better management duration of the treatment can be very prolonged in that condition at times it could be infinite even but patients definitely would be respond better to our conditions as such our treatment as such 
Then another variety of the conditions is ulcerative colitis. Uh, that's the typical Tridoshila Atisara, where Sushura has mentioned typically Bala Buddheshu Asadhyaya in a very young age or very old age, it's a Asadhyaya. And uh, when it's a Sarvalingo Apipati, when it's a acute permanent condition, it's also Asadhyaya. So we need to make out that condition, uh, assessment of the condition is important. An acute fulminant ulcerative colitis, of course, is an acute medical emergency and I don't think that only with our medicines we can manage. But once the patient has become a chronic condition, definitely our medicines would be much better than the so-called sulfamethazole or other drugs. So acute conditions which are considered as asadhya, the treatment protocol would be different. So I will not go into that part now. So in the chronic recurrent conditions, when the condition becomes chronic, in a typical ulcerative colitis, our treatment, my treatment would be Gandhakarasayana, Anandaviravim, uh, Anandaviravim and Mustagarista, occasionally Smithsagarasa. Uh, Pichyapasti is the other treatment. And uh, uh, persons who are consuming the sulfamethazole, mesopal like drugs for a long duration, that can be withdrawn with our drug. And the only thing is, duration is quite long, at times it could be one or two years, but there could be a significant resolution. Uh, rarely, patient would have a recurrent fulminant colitis. If there is a recurrent fulminant colitis, naturally, the treatment protocol would be different and it's only in the chronic colitis that we have discussed that. And that recurrent fulminant colitis symptoms are typically mentioned in the text and that's exactly Sarpir Medo Vasavara Ambu Taila Madhyak Shirak Shadurukum Savedyat when the stools would have the appearance like a certain ghee or so on where the lots of fat is content or you will have blood mixed or blood content like manjistabam, mastulungabam, isram, shitam, pretagandhi, anjanabam the description of the stools which is mentioned in the text is absolutely perfect you will be seeing exactly the same presentations where it could be even foul smelling and uh, having that uh, decayed substance like appearance kardamabam, sasaushnam these are all the conditions which are suggestive of extreme fulminant colitis like conditions and uh, according to Sushla, these would be Hanyad Yetat Pradipam Bhavetche Kshinam Hanyascha Uprasargaha Prabhutaha It can result in severe complications and it can be fatal. So it's important that that Asadhya condition cannot be managed with the, our conservative management alone. It needs a either some other medical management, the component which I will not deal with now. Uh, so it's not something which we can treat in a simple clinic conditions. Of course, in a hospitalized conditions where we may have combined with other drugs, we can manage that. So that's about the Atisara as one of the other conditions. Next of the condition which we discuss would be the constipation. Now, when I say the constipation again, there would be a lot of uh, confusion about that word. And the patients present with that symptom, patients complain of constipation with various conditions. To go, go into all that issue would be quite difficult, but I try to comprehensively consider that constipation as it is to be understood, as it has to be assessed in the clinical presentation, uh, present part as such. Uh, uh, and important is that constipation also is not a symptom alone, it's considered as a specific disability and uh, ICD code is given and that K59 is the ICD code. Uh, secondary constipation is another issue, we will try to go into that part. The uh, one of the, uh, are of course, uh, according to our text, it's a constipation is a due to Vega Varodha. Purisha Vega Varodha is the primary cause of the constipation. But now in the current terminology, when we discuss about the constipation, there are two important issues. One is about the consistency and form of the stools and the other is the frequency of defecation. Now, the, for the assessment of the consistency of the stools, there is a standard now chart, Bristol school chart, which is available anywhere in the uh, web. You can see that. And uh, the, to make out whether the person has a constipation or not, a real constipation and then the pulse constipation that needs to be differentiated. The pattern which we follow is based upon the type of the stools and the type of the stools either it could be hard lumps or it could be like lumpy and saucer like 
which are suggestive of a constipation. Whereas the normal stools are sausage shaped with the, some cracks over the surface, that normal. Or it's a smooth sa sausage like a snake like that's also normal. Soft uh, blocks with the clear cut edges, it's a suggestive of lacking of the fiber. That's about the normal consist. These three are can be considered as the normal where there could be dietary variation. Of course, diarrhea is based upon the consistency of the stools. To consider whether a patient is constipated or not, there is one general criteria, international criteria, round fourth criteria, uh, which may not be applicable in our conditions. The uh, it should be like according to round fourth criteria, a patient must have experienced at least two of the following symptoms over the preceding six months. Then only the diagnosis of constipation is done. That ICD code of constipation applies when these are seen like fewer than three spontaneous bowel movements per week. Now this three movements per week is for the western country where they primarily the diet is less rigid diet and where a simple uh, tissue paper would be enough. Whereas Indian diet where we consume more fiber and we need buckets of water, uh, this may not be true. We need to modify that. So I would say even if a person doesn't pass the stools in two days, once in two days, I would consider that as a, a constipation. Need not wait for that six months criteria even. Straining for more than 20% of the defecation attempts, lumpy or hard stools for at least 25% of the defecation attempts, sensation of anorectal obstruction or blockage for at least 25% of the defection, defecation attempts, sensation of incomplete defecation for at least 25% of the defecation attempts, Manual maneuvering required for uh, defecation, at least 20% of the defecation items. This is the wrong fourth criteria to make the diagnosis of constipation. If we follow the same criteria, you may not get many of those patients who are really constipated from that technical point of view. You will have plenty of patients who will continue to complain that they have constipation, but they do not fall under the criteria and that gives you the trouble from the clinical principle. So, uh, we will not follow that guideline rigidly in our status as such. So, what we assess would be now based upon that patients who have that symptoms of constipation. I would use the word symptoms of constipation. And when I say this, I would be suggesting about what the patient would feel. You will have a large number of patients who feel that they are constipated, but they are not under the typical criteria of the constipation as per our guideline. And they are quite troublesome and they will always have you know, lots of um, irritation in the clinical practice. Uh, lot, they will be one of the irritant groups of the patients, I would say. And uh, such of the assessment of that condition is a one important issue. My assessment would be, I would be considering them mainly under these four categories. Normal transit constipation, where the bubble movements otherwise are normal then slow transit constipation and based upon that we will plan the management. Outlet obstruction is where there is a real narrowing of the outlet, either it could be a stricture which is beyond the medical scope, we may require surgical intervention. Then pelvic floor dysynergia. Very interesting is that pelvic floor dysynergia is one of the very common occurring, more frequently occurring causes of a feeling of incomplete defecation and it also has an implication over the clinical presentation of the piles, hemorrhoids. So that part I will be trying to deal with somewhat in more detail about the design idea. Now, another group of the conditions where the patient would have a incomplete urge for defecation. Again, it's not under the issue of constipation, not the standard constipation are persons who consume lots of drugs. Diabetes mellitus patients usually would have this complication, symptom of uh, this uh, constipation. Hypothyroidism, neuromuscular diseases, where again you need not treat them as constipation, but patient would always complain of their bowel movements and uh, many times unnecessarily purgatives or laxatives are given, there is no need of that. Patients with the fissures, hemorrhoids or tumors also can may complain of constipation and there is no need of treating that constipation separately, you need to treat those conditions. So that becomes the whole issue as such. Now, one of the, one important issue when we deal with the patients with presenting with that uh, abnormal uh, uh, feeling of defecation, we need to take the history of the drugs consumed. And uh, 
the common drugs very well known again i you know, it may not be possible to give a complete list i am just suggesting about the very well well known drugs which can produce the symptom of constipation would be antidepressants anticholinergics opioids antacids calcium channel blockers even non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs sympathomimetic drugs and uh, the many psychotropic drugs and very important is uh, laxatives persons who have taken laxatives for a long term uh, important they tend to develop the symptoms again i would say like it's not that standard constipation but patient would have that symptoms of the constipation which can result in a dysenergy later so the history of the drugs is one of the important issue wherever possible we can either modify those prescriptions or swap the prescriptions depending upon the possibility which can give a huge relief to the patient that's one part now coming to the real management of such patients the i what i approach would be in the normal transit constipation i would be considering this as a the sandharanath adhyashanath ajirnath adhyashanath the varto vahin dushyant durbal agnehi krishasya cha व्यायामात अतिसंतापात शीत उष्णक्रम सेवनात दॅट्स द टिपिकल ऑफ वर्जो वह श्रोतो दुष्टी लक्षणात अगेन इट्स नॉट ए स्पेसिफिक डिसीज एंटिटी अँड व्हेरी ऑफन यू विल कम अक्रॉस सच पेशंट्स हू आर मोस्टली हॅविंग स्ट्रेस अँड ऑफन दे आर रिलेटेड टू द क्वालिटी ऑफ फूड वेन दे से सर्टन स्पेसिफिक ड्रग्स आय वुड नॉट से लाईक एनी स्पेसिफिक लाईक सर्टन स्पेसिफिक फूड वुड बी प्रोड्युसिंग मोर ऑफ कॉन्सिपेशन अँड quite interesting is normal transit constipation patients often say that they have a bowel better bowel movement when they consume more spicy chilies so usually in a other persons chilies would be reducing the stool movement or bowel movements but in person with normal transit constipation chilies will increase the bowel movement and they may have a better passage of the stools and usually the stools are harder now the management would be the most important path of the management is with the lifestyle management most of the times it is about the stress patients would have particularly those who are under continuous stress like they are not able to maintain that like time schedule see for one of the proper bowel movements a maintenance of the time schedule and a developing a physiological cycle is important every day you go to the uh, you at the same specific time naturally the bowel movements will be better if you are not able to maintain that time schedule that itself can be cause for the discomfort and the patient may have developing these complications as well so that lifestyle suggestion a water intake fiber diet more than any specific medicine would be enough in such conditions rarely we may give prescriptions and my prescription would be either ayurvedic or dhuna or draksha rasa not any of the other specific drugs slow transit constipation is uh, the other way which often is seen by the person and this are typically of mandarni that the patient would have a loose stools or maybe soft stools it's a dinna or vibhanda either occasionally there could be harder or there could be loose stools but still the patient would not have a proper movement of the stools and the patient would also have a impaired um, this appetite and discomfort in the abdomen vibhanda atopa antra kujana mukha shosha these are all the possible clinical symptoms which you can see and the typical would be the patient would have that abdominal symptoms pain nausea these are the typical features of the slow transit constipation and the slow transit constipation patients they have to be managed with the deeper anxieties that's what sushila has mentioned or bhagavata has mentioned like takram savarchala vyavashik shodhitam guda bhaya takra is considered as a one of the best option buttermilk is one of the best option uh, not that the medicines persons who consume buttermilk regularly in a proper manner uh, rarely they develop this kind of complication but somehow use of buttermilk has become out of fashion now and people rarely use that and they need medical treatment and my prescription in such conditions would be admittedly aragya dini kumari asava as a deepana patana ushadis it's not the treatment for the constipation it's not a forget your laxatives in children instead of permitting the aragya dini i prefer gandakarsan and kumari asava as the prescription and 
in children particularly that junk foods like uh, chocolate and so on they need to be avoided giving more of fruits and vegetables also helps in that slow trans transformation so basic issue of the treatment in these conditions is a the maintenance of agni deepana the pachana deepte agno vatike gunme vibande anila vartaso brahmani and time then of course brahmani and pachani the food should be having more nourishing substances at times it could be the ghee or butter milk which is a other issue now next common troublesome condition is the dysenergic defecation and this is one of the most common presentation for a un unsatisfactory defecation symptoms in the patients now to understand that dysenergia we you need to have certain basic idea of the basic physiology the physiology of defecation in the anus and the rectum the ultimate of course we will not go into all that details of the neurological control then we have say there has to be a complex and neurological control of a involuntary activity of defecation becoming a voluntary activity in children in newborn and in lower animals the defecation is a involuntary activity but later it becomes voluntary and that's one of the uh, important learning process uh, and rather the most difficult learning activity and uh, the usually it happens said like those who have learned the control of this uh, defecation it, it's not at all difficult to learn anything you can learn anything as such anyway that that's we will not go into that part but primarily to have that uh, continence the, when the stools do not pass out leak out that's prevented by a pressure gradient gradient between the rectum and the anus in the resting condition the anal pressure would be a more whereas rectal pressure would be lower during defecation the rectal pressure increases and the anal pressure reduces so that allows the stools to pass through that's about what the normal synergia would occur and this involves lots of uh, uh, synergic uh, areas uh, synergic functions of the nervous system and uh, a impairment of this synergia i would consider this as udavarta the udavarta exactly is about the dysenergia as such and the, in the dysenergia you may have any of those symptoms like ato pashulam prigartanam ya sangat purisha sesada udhavata that's the typical udavarta mentioned in samhitas which are the dysenergias from the present day's point of view the dysenergia are categorized into four categories now this is important from the clinical point of view this is important that dysenergia type 1 which is commonly seen in many of the patients is typically when the person goes for the defecation the rectal pressure increases but the anal pressure instead of getting reduced it tends to increase and hence it produces a, a difficulty in passage of the stools typical history would be patient has to strain for long period as such often the patients have a habit of singing songs in the toilet or at times smoking and so on so they tend to remain in the toilet for a longer duration very often patients would have fissures also and very often patient may have a history of manipulation of the fingers he needs to have their fingers as such and it's usually that the initial mass of the stools are hard and then the patient may pass the stools so the first passage of the stools will be quite difficult and often these are seen in vata prakriti patient and this also has a relevance with the presentation of the hemorrhoids that's a part which i will deal with when we deal with the hemorrhoids in the next part so uh, identification of these patients is uh, quite important and in such patients the treatment would be one is the life cycle sedation so stress has to be avoided punctuality of the defecation has to be maintained then the treatment would be agni tundi arogya vardhini abhayarista that it has to be a combination of both pachana as well as anulomana because it is udavarta and anulomana and usually main prescription would be abhayarista as the prescription as anulomana affect occasionally or rarely if this doesn't respond a banatela matra basti also is a quite useful to prevent these conditions as such that's the type 1 in the type 2 varieties that typically the rectal pressure doesn't increase patient is not able to uh, press as such so rectal pressure doesn't increase during the straining and uh, 
the what happens is the patient strains but he is not able to pass the stools and the patient would not be able to pass the stools for many days like two or days three days or so on once in two or three days that the patient passes the stools and because the patient has delayed uh, defecation the stools are harder if the patient passes the stools frequently the stools are not harder as such that's how uh, the stools uh, passage would be when the patient goes for defecation it takes a long time for the initiation of the activity once the stools have opened up the passage has opened up patient will pass on the stools comparatively easier that's the typical type to dysenergia conditions which is often seen in pickup of the patients and uh, this can be made out when you do a corrective examination even uh, the main prescription in such conditions would be gandhakarasana kumari asava and a fiber diet helps occasionally virechana also helps virechana when i say it's not giving purgative drugs regularly instead the typical virechana package treatment where you give snehana for till the sneha lakshana is seen then virechana and then sansarjana krab that's the virechana chikitsa which helps in such patients i don't suggest any purgative in that condition instead gandhakarasana and kumari asava is the prescribed drug there type 3 is the condition where the patient would have a increased rectal pressure whereas the anal pressure doesn't correspondingly increase as such so what happens is patient would have a increased frequency of defecation he goes for the defecation quite frequently even passes the stools but doesn't have a sense of satisfaction even after the passing of the stools patient may have a feeling like there is something hidden in and they need to be assessed to carefully because a similar symptoms also can occur in patients with them this mass in the rectum as such so sense of incomplete evacuation is one of the important issue that could be the flatulence like symptoms and in such conditions such patients purgatives like uh, castrol uh, also can be used as such it can help in such conditions and my prescription would be agni tindi jira kadjarista would be my prescription in such conditions as such type 4 of course is not really a constipation and it's often due to the old age or neurological patients where the tone of the muscles is reduced and hence they may not have an urge at all and they may pass out the stools involuntarily incontinence is the major uh, features there in such conditions of course treatment will be that underlying pathology needs to be treated and maybe the patient may have to have a help of evacuation with the soap water enema as quite uh, regularly and usually main prescription would be chandra prabha shogandarista try to strengthen the muscles the reflexes would be strengthened but uh, it's not really a constipation in that sense but that's a both the type of dysenergia now dysenergia doesn't need to be assessed only with the sophisticated in, instrument like anal manometry not necessary if you are sensitive and you do a parietal examination definitely we can make out that variation in the grip in the normal conditions when we put the finger in we can feel that the anal grip is more whereas the rectal grip will be lesser the fingers would have a free space over the rectal area in type 1 dysenergia you can feel that grip of the anus as well as the rectum more frequently or that faster grip can be seen whereas in the type 4 that grip is being lesser so once we get accustomed to that as i have shown in the graphs that pressure feeling can be made out with the ear finger when the patient is asked to squeeze when you put the finger in and then ask the patient to squeeze out that difference in the pressure can be made out to a great extent and the management can be better and that gives a, a better results more satisfied results in dealing with the patients of so called constipation i use that word so called constipation because uh, it may not be that typical constipation criteria but patients complaining of the constipation as such as far as the incidence is concerned the type 1 dysenergia is uh, the most common variety more than 50% of the patients would have type 1 dysenergia whereas type 4 is limited to the neurological condition so uh, to a great extent Uh, you can have a more prejudice over the type 1 dysenergy in making the diagnosis that's about the constipation and as i assess in the clinical practice then another variety of the constipation it's not really a constipation but cons- related to the constipation is a overflow diarrhea not a common issue but 
often it is seen in the patients who have very chronic constipation and hence trico lifts are formed and once the trico lifts that hard stools are formed patient would not be able to pass the stools some co component of the liquid is passed so patient says that the patient is passing the stools but he will have all the feeling of the uh, constipation at times even that trico lifts may be palpable over that time it often occurs in patients who have a neurological pathology or in very old age patients it can occur and uh, uh, rare such condition i don't say that it's a common condition but in all such conditions it's quite important that we do a parietal examination and in the parietal examination the stools uh, fecolits can be palpated or at times it could be that the severe conditions like carcinoma rectum the growth also could be palpated so parietal examination is important and if it's a absolute fecolit a manual removal of those fecal uh, fecolits is important you need to put in the finger and then dig out the stools i usually joke it as a the cold field cold or gold field kgf where you need to pull out those uh, valuable substances as such then ajirna or malabsorption which i have referred to earlier also it also has a a specific code icd code we have referred that malabsorption in the atisara but in addition to that the specific variety of the ajirna which is mentioned uh, in our samhitas where it is always related to the food is a again it could be the vidanta ajirna vishtabda ajirna which are mentioned as such and uh, the basic treatment even without the medical management which is mentioned in sushrutha buddhi tatra ame langhanam karyam vidante vamana medam a langhana is suggested in the vidanta ajirna vamana could be a uh, prescribed this is rarely used as such whereas rashashesh ajirna is it just fasting could be the choice of the treatment now that's uh, about uh, not a major issue it's uh, uh, something of repetition but only the issue is uh, i have referred to this because uh, it's about uh, the uh, icd code and uh, that uh, uh, indigestion as such now irritable bowel syndrome again we have discussed that irritable bowel syndrome in the context of uh, the atisara shobhada atisara as such now a bit more about that the current classification of the irritable bowel syndrome and the approach could be the classification of the irritable bowel syndrome which i consider as a, a variety of the ajirna different variants of ajirna they are mainly categorized as a diarrhea predominant constipation predominant or mixed diarrhea and constipation and then of course the unclassified now this has a relevance to what charaka has categorized as a the varieties like uh, uh, bish bishab the bidad the varieties as such the diarrhea prominent and the constipation prominent the bishab the is the constipation prominent bidad the is the diarrhea prominent like conditions as such now that's about the same issue and uh, the important is when the patient has any of those uh, alarming signs the, like weight loss iron deficiency uh, then you need to thoroughly investigate rest of the conditions they can be managed on the same lines of uh, the shokaja atisara so though it is ajirna it can be managed in the same lines of uh, shokaja atisara like adhimundi adhimundi jirakatari sar mastakari sar now another important issue is uh, a gut brain axis a large number of patients who have a neurological symptom psycho psychological symptom psychological disorders abnormal behaviors uh, anxiety the basic cause could be in the abdomen and this is now a identified issue it's a recently identified issue like a abnormality of the bowel the presence of the bowel mucous uh, these colonies bacterial colonies would affect the psyche and uh, many of those neuro uh, psychiatric psychological conditions or the neurological conditions they can be managed with the a better management of the diet and bowel movements uh, now this uh, a very recently identified concept in the contemporary system whereas ayurveda and our ancient system has specified like the annam aham anna annam aham annam aham my personality is about anna that's what the taitiri upanishad says and uh, the all that whatever i have is about the anna that food which is one which makes it 
So that relationship of the put and bubble movements in relation to the whole personality issue is uh, the major new development from the contemporary point of view, but this is well known. So whole of your personality, your activity is dependent upon type of the food which you consume. And now we use our gut-brain axis, but uh, considering it is uh, Sattvika, Rajasa, Samas, Aharas, where you will have the personality reflected, this was a well-known and a strength of Ayurveda. And if we follow this regime of diet, like Sattvika Aharas and uh, main avoiding the Tamas Aharas, that would be the best, best of the thing to prevent any of the diseases and maintain a hygiene as such. And another important issue is uh, in very chronic disease conditions like uh, Clostridium infections, one of the choices in the treatment which is now prescribed is uh, a fecal transplant. Very interesting. It uh, has been under a limited guidance, enforcement, enforcement guidance by the FDO, FDA from 2013 and a large number of patients are being now treated with in USA but not in India. So transplanting a healthy person's bubble organisms, it's not really fecus but the fe from the feces the organisms are separated and transplanting into a person who has a very chronic clostridium infection, this has become a fashion of the treatment now. So in the contemporary science too, the importance of the diet, uh, the food, and that uh, possibility of uh, a transplanting a healthy person's organism to the other has become a maybe the uh, latest of the treatment. Whereas uh, from Ayurvedic point of view, this is a well-known issue as such. That's in general about the gastrointestinal tract and uh, that diet-related issues. Now the last part in that would be the Arsho Atisara Grahani Vikaraha Prayena Anyo Nindana Bhutaha Sanne Analay Santhi Nasanthi Dikte Rakshayad Atasthe Shivisheshato Agni From Ayurvedic point of view that Agni is to be protected and if there is a Agni Mande, if Agni is affected it can result in a large number of conditions Arsho Atisara Grahani etc. Among those conditions one is about the Arshas. Now I would refer that Arshas also as a, a Anamahaswadu Dusti, controversial issue, whether it has to be or so on, we are not going that controversy. Uh, now, uh, from the uh, basic approach management point of view, Bhattacharshas, they are typically the presence of the fissure and most of the times it is accompanied with the type 1 dysenergia. Type 1 dysenergia, now I have included the Tarshas in the current discussion because we have discussed about the dysenergia and hence it has a relevance. And the typical presentation of the Bhatta Jarshas would be the same where you will have a fissure, a wound as such, uh, where the lesion would have the, the, even the tag-like appearance, patient would be constipated, pain and hard stools are the characteristic feature and typically it's related to the type 1 dysenergia. So if you have managed that type 1 dysenergia effectively, this can be prevented, that Bhatta Jarshas can be prevented. But once the patient has a fissure, then the treatment will be, we need to treat that Agnimandya more specifically and the treatment duration can be longer and my prescription in that condition will be Gandhagarasayana, Kankayani and Avipatikara. Whereas Pittajarshas, it's a characteristic where the mass tends to get prolapsed easily and once it gets prolapsed, it gets blocked. It doesn't get reduced as such. This is the typical and this is what we see in case of Type 2 dysenergia typically, and uh, main prescription would be Gandhakarasana, Kamadaka, Vipatikara. In these conditions, there will be more bleeding. Initially, it will be bleeding. You may not be seeing the masses initially, but once the masses come out, they tend to remain flashed out and they become painful. That's the typical of the Pitta Jarshas. Whereas uh, uh, the Rakta Jarshas, you will have a strangulation sense where Rakta jani, nagrodha pravohani, these are the typical symptoms which is often seen in type 3 type of the dysenergia where the mass is uh, strangulated due to the uh, dysenergia. And once the patient has developed this presentation, my prescription would be Gandhakar Sayana, Kamaduga, Ushira Sava or Draksharista Pizzaria treatment as such. A third degree prolapsus is uh, where the patient would have usually the type 4 or the tone is reduced, where that could be a mass prolapsed as such. 
and uh, a persistent plaque mass which doesn't get stimulated easily and in that condition my prescription will be gandharva sana chitragadi madbadaleha surgery is of course an option of course uh, because we have referred to garshas the sahadarshas which is mentioned is a typical of either intestinal polyposis where essentially the surgical management is required where the patient would have systemic symptoms of anemia weight loss etc so sahadarsha cycles are mass intestinal polyposis now coming to the basic issue which is of significance would be management of darshas according to ayurveda as we well know are of the four categories beshajam charah agni shastramadi shastra is the last option only when there is a specific indication present guideline who guideline also is according to the same like only the grade 1 grade 2 grade 3 you can have a conservative management surgery is in one suggested only in the advanced conditions where either the medical treatment fails or there is some specific complications like a prolapse mass or a thrombosis mass so uh, majority of the conditions they need to be treated medical now my clinical experience also is the same like in the initial phase of my clinical practice as in case of appendicitis my patients data the number of surgeries which i have done in the initial stages of my practice were more compared to the number of patients which we have treated whereas with our management that assessment of that uh, the designers and prescribing that specific drugs can reduce the number of surgeries and a non surgical intervention can be very effective and more acceptable to the patient that's what we see as it and that's also another identity of the shalya tantra as such so from that point of view a comprehensive management of the arshas is a, a quite important issue and uh, one of the common errors which are done by in the clinical practice are many of the physicians they miss a proctitis and they may diagnose this wrongly as a, a hemorrhage and the usual management of hemorrhoids would be harmful treatment like half hearted inter- treatment like kshara uh, sutra kshara application or maybe the surgical intervention in case of proctitis can be quite harmful and hence to differentiate that would be a quite critical issue patients presenting with a bleeding per rectum or a mass in the rectum need not always be hemorrhoids a proctitis incidence also is increasing now these days i don't know the real causes but the number of patients of proctitis i am seeing is increasing rarely this is typically a complication of the gudapata which is mentioned in sushura where uh, the pre- patient's presentation would be pain before and after defecation this is a very important a typical history of pain before and after defecation is important a typical uh, fissure in ano would always have pain after defecation but a patient having pain before and after defecation suspect proctitis and mostly the patient is not constipated frequency of stools are increased and the patient would have a prolonged history and when you do the examination you can see that areas of inflammation that mucosal congestion is seen and in such conditions never do any interventional treatment any interventional treatment can be producing more chaos more trouble to the patient and non interventional treatment like gandagrasana and beravi alpatical kurna is a, a definitely better choice and from the clinical point of view it is important to make out that then last of the condition related to the gastrointestinal tract which is commonly in the clinical practice are the worm infestations of course with the worm infestations our text would be discussing about that uh, large number of varieties of the worms but from the practical point of view pin worms and round worms can be effectively managed with the ayurvedic medicines Uh, hookworms i have a doubt whether we really can be uh, our treatment can be useful or not i have a doubt because number of patients also are lesser in our area uh, where i practice uh, and uh, uh, the I, i i don't think that the whatever the results i have seen is not satisfactory as such but in pinworms and hookworms definitely our treatment is much better than so called anti alimentic drugs like mefenazol and so on and my prescription would be trimphtara sagandaka rasayana and vinata arista usually given for four days and uh, uh, then uh, to prevent the further growth i prescribe arogya rudini kumariyasa which is a prakriti vidhyata chikitsa if necessary 
it can be repeated after a month. That Premipudhara Gandhakara Sayana could be repeated after a month or so. Two or three courses of, of four days for one or two months would be effectively re preventing the pinworms and roundworms and a definitely better and more acceptable treatment than the so-called anti-helminthic drugs. Now, last part, some basic issue. Sushmita has considered one uh, that Anahasodas as a way to Anahasodas. Often the students are con confused whether Sushmita had two mouths. Now, it's not about that. To interpret that two Anahasodas, we need to identify the functions of the gastrointestinal tract in two ways. Like the first part is consumption of the food reaching up to the stomach, where the food is consumed and retained. The next part is the absorptive area. Now, the first part is a mouth to the uh, amashaya. That's uh, the first part of the one anahasotas, where the reception is the important thing and digestion. The next part of the anahasotas is uh, the absorptive areas. So that's how it has to be understood. And not that social had two mouths as well. This is just about the casual issue. Now, the other important issue when we discuss about the anahasotas is uh, the currently whatever we see as uh, the patients as a large number of patients the diseases are produced due to the junk food and it's well established the causes different varieties of the disease every system of the body could be affected due to the junk food and it is well known it's not that i am saying sushuka also has mentioned same shushka ahara virudha ahara vishambhi ahara these are all the basic causes of the adnimadya and whatever we consider as a junk food they include uh, uh, all that and you will have large number of diseases. If you avoid the junk food, a large number of diseases can be avoided and a healthy life can be achieved. But unfortunately, the fast food or junk food market is increasing and it is becoming popular and the predicted uh, this uh, junk food market in 2024 would be quite alarming and uh, there is a necessity to make the society aware of that. Though we have all that regulations and then uh, the associations which are maybe organizations which give a safety condition, FSSAI, they are, none of them are absolutely safe and it's quite important to make the society aware of that. And if you avoid this junk food, reduce the consumption of the junk food, large number of diseases can be prevented. And the another important study which I felt like it would be relevant as a, another common cause for most of the common gastrointestinal tract abnormalities, I would not say diseases, and malfunctioning in the gastrointestinal areas are consumption of unnecessary health promoting substances, vitamins, tonics and so on. Now, and it has become a habit. Almost every patient coming to you would be having any of these. Now, a large number of study is done on over 9,92,129 participants, healthy persons and 277 trials all over the world. This was analyzed and it was published uh, and the results are so-called health promoting substances, uh, low salt diet, of course it has a protective issue, it, it protects, it helps. Omega-3 fatty acids have a protection, myocardial infarction can be avoided. Folic acid, it has a protective role. Then all the others, calcium and all the other vitamins, they are harmful or they can be having no effect. Everything else is having no effect. Vitamin and calcium, they can be harmful and can produce a stroke. Now, that's another important issue. Almost every person above the age, even not even above the age of 40, every almost large number of people, there is a habit of consuming so-called tonics, vitamins and so on, which are unnecessary and they can be a cause for the diseases as such and they need to be avoided and of course quite difficult to convince the people but at least for ourselves it could be a convincing one and now it's well known like there is no protective advantage, only the harmful complications and hence the carry home points are if you take care of the food follow the regimes of the consumption of the food 
एस एस दुड इन टर्म्स ऑफ प्रकृति कारण संयोग राशि देश काल ऑल दैट फैक्टर्स अबाउट द फूड व्हिच इज मेंशन इन द टेक्स्ट एंड द पैटर्न ऑफ द कंसम्पशन ऑफ द फूड इन टर्म्स ऑफ पुष्टम स्निग्धम मात्रावत गिरने विराविदम निष्टे देशे इष्ट सर्व उपकरण नाति दुर्गम नाति विलंबितम अदल्पन अहसन तन्मनाह दुगिता तन्मनाह दुगिता दिस आर द इंपॉर्टेंट व्हिच इज इंपॉर्टेंट एसेट वी हैव टू इंश्योर दैट दैट कल्चर इज रीएस्टैब्लिश्ड and that would be helping the society quite significantly and we is a well established like a food is the cause for the disease and a careful assessment of the food and careful consumption of food can prevent the disease and can help in a maintenance of health of the society and uh, the basic issues which we have to take care are napkapta atita kalam va hilanika madhati va take care in the punctuality of the food take care in the quantity of the food and uh, that would prevent the diseases and that's one of the important message which we have to con- uh, convey to the society and with that i'll conclude thank you thank you all